Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I suppose, as he said, my name is Tim Isiki. Um, I'm the head of the track delivery units in Irish Rail. Um, and this morning, I'll be taking you through the advancements Irish Rail have made in our track renewal techniques. Um, just an overview of what we'll be going through this morning, just a background to the track delivery unit, our delivery model, our technological evolution, uh, a whistle stop tour of our delivery process, our rates of productivity and our quality control measures, um, our experience with higher speed handbacks, and at the next steps moving on to. And I appreciate this is a little bit more technical than, than previous presentations, but please bear with me. Um, so just a background to the, the structure in Irish Rail. So we've an integrated structure under the one CEO, Jim Mead. Uh, we have a director of capital investments, Paul Hendrick, who's leading the capital expansion of the network, as AJ has outlined, um, all over the country. Um, we have a director of RU, uh, Billy Gilpin, who operates the train services and owns and operates the fleet. And then we have a director infrastructure manager, Eamon Balance, who operates and maintains the existing network, both civil structurals, operations, and the signaling side. Um, over the signaling side of things, our chief signaling engineer, Tony Ennis, who's overall signaling electrical and telecoms on the network. And then our chief civil engineer, Cahal Mangan, who um, oversees all the track and structures assets on the network. And that's where we sit under Cahal as the CC track delivery unit. So just a background to the, the track delivery unit. Uh, we're a specialist in-house track delivery team. Um, we were initially created uh, to deliver the, the Corkland Rehabilitation Project, or the CLRP, which was initially scoped to be a 250 million euro project um, to revitalize the, the Dublin to Cork line. Um, as heavy rail, as Andrew outlined earlier on, is, is the backbone of the public transport network, the Dublin to Cork line is the spine of our network, taking most intercity traffic in and out of Dublin, Houston, from Cork, Tralee, Waterford, Limerick, Galway, Kilkenny, Westport, and Ballina. Um, unfortunately, um, again, as Andrew outlined, two years of underinvestment, um, and also having an aging asset, the route was getting to over 40 years. Um, it was showing its, its, its age, and unfortunately, quality, quality dropped. Um, and at one stage, it hit a point where we had 21 minutes and 28 minutes of emergency speed restrictions on the line, up and down roads, respectively. So not a good place to be. Um, so the project was initiated. Um, obviously, the scope of the project was to, to maintain the route operationally. We did achieve some improvements, which you can see. So to date, we've relayed 70 miles of the route. Um, we've ballast cleaned over 165 miles um, to date. Um, and as a result of that work, we've increased the line speed of 90 miles of track to 100 miles an hour. Um, so a significant benefit from what was conceived to be just a maintenance project to keep the route operational. And that resulted this year, earlier this year, uh, for the fastest ever journey time being introduced from Cork to Dublin of two, of two hours, 14 minutes, which is a good step to go. But obviously a lot more to do um, in, that, in that project, and hopefully we can fully realize the potential of the Cork line in, in years to come. Um, the track delivery unit, we've also been engaged to deliver the track-based elements of the capital investment program. So not only renewing the existing network, but also delivering the track-based uh, elements of the capital investments program. It's, it's AJ's outline in Cork, DAR Plus West, Galway, there's various projects all over the country that we're involved in. And obviously with that significant investment, we've significantly modernized our renewal techniques. Um, so just an overview of our delivery model. So we're a self-delivery delivery model. So at the center of the track delivery unit, we have our engineering, surveying, design, project management. But we've also all these stakeholders that feed into this process. Um, it's critical we've external and internal stakeholders, our internal stakeholders, our production facility in Port Leash, who manufactures our rails and sleepers, um, our OTMs, all the wires rail do own our tampers and regulators. We're very lucky to have Romberg Sarsha, who operate and maintain that fleet for us. Um, our engineering trains, which is continuously welded rail trains, or our ballast delivery trains, our colleagues in the signaling, telecoms, and electrical department, obviously critical to any project delivery, and then we've got our external. Um, supply chain partners, particularly our planter suppliers, I know a lot of them are in the room today, um, a critical part to any project that we do, and there's a really good relationship with them. Um, our labour suppliers, obviously we supplement our in-house permanent way resources with external labour as well. And then we've obviously got our ballast suppliers that bring in the ballast. Um, so just to say, in this, it's very much a, a collaborative effort with all of those stakeholders. We're extremely lucky, not only with our internal stakeholders, but with our external stakeholders as well. And you'll see later on in the presentation how they contribute uh, greatly to, to any project delivery we do. 
Um, so a journey through our technological evolution and probably the foundation of that evolution, it was built on our surveying technology. Um, so in 2013, we started off with dumpy, dumpy surveys, obviously very labor intensive, um, had to be done during the day, increasing additional risk, um, subject to booking errors and um, errors in that way. Um, then 2015, we started Ballaslini initially, we introduced GPS trolley surveys, um, so moving the, the surveying activity to nights, higher output, higher accuracy. Then in 2020, we graduated to total station surveys, increasing our accuracy. Then in 2022, uh, total station and laser scanning, so not only picking up track geometry, but picking up um, other elements that surround the track as well, other features that might be restricting us. And 2024, we've recently moved to IMU and laser scanning, so again, increasing our level of accuracy. Following on from our design process, or from our surveying process, is obviously our design. Um, so just to put into context where we came from, um, unfortunately, we were at a stage where we were doing our designs through Microsoft Excel, a Halad-based system, which is from the 1970s, whereas we now use Guido Novatrack. Um, so it's a Trimble-based software, and we have also our surveying equipment is also Trimble-based, so we've one integrated system which eliminates any processing errors and the files can be exported seamlessly from one to the other. Um, that software can compare the existing and new alignments giving lift and slew diagrams. It can be exported to a variety of file types and then uploaded directly onto any machines you want, whether it's on-site machine controlled excavators, dozers, or onto our tampers and ballast cleaners. And then that's just a snapshot of what the driver would see on-site. He's got his design file and he has to follow that. Um, then moving on to our level control, and I suppose what do I mean by, by level control? Um, it's ensuring that the, the geometry we're installing our track to is first of all safe and accurate level control guarantees that, um, but also it's first time right. So it reduces follow on works, get it right first time, it makes a, streamless, uh, a seamless uh, delivery process. And also that extends the life of the asset then by the re reduction in follow on tamping. Um, so our journey in with level control, in 2013 we started out with a 2D system, a laser control system on dozers, um, and then the, the excavators were, were man-managed. Were, were man um, in 2018 we graduated to a 3D machine control, so GPS-based system on our dozers. Um, in 2020 we ex had an extensive rollout of our 3D machine control, not only on dozers but on excavators, both RRV and tracked, and then in 2020 um, we moved on to 3D machine control using total station. So with our satellites, there's obviously the restriction of overhead structures, areas of cover, whereas the total station control machine says direct line of sight and overcomes all those. And obviously there's an increased uh, level of accuracy with those. So furthermore on our delivery process, uh, the formation works. Um, you can see there, uh, we, we run two excavators in advance for moving heavy overburden. We run one GPS dozer to follow that, which gives a rough grade plus minus 20 mil, and then a final grade of UTS dozer com completed to high accuracy, followed by our compaction. And what's built into this system, it's kind of, this, the site setup is designed as kind of a, a production facility, one moving after the other, but what's also built into this is a redundancy factor. Um, unfortunately, working on live track, we can't have the luxury of machines falling down and delaying services in the morning. Services have to run the following day. So we have an element of redundancy built into all this process. So if a machine fails, we can reduce our scope, still get the track back safely and on time at just a slightly reduced scope. Um, you can see in that picture there, that's our, our larger scale operation with the large dozer and large roller. And then we've also a, a smaller situation, a smaller setup with a smaller roller and smaller skid steer for those tighter areas. Um, then moving on to our compaction, so once we've got our ballast level to the correct level, compaction is key. Um, and what was once a very non-scientific uh, method, it was just a number of passes of a whacker plate was considered good enough, is now very much engineered, data driven and targeted. Um, so again, this is where particularly our plantar contractors came with us on the journey. We engaged with them. They had confidence to invest, to support, delivering the enhanced railway that we have. So we've got a 16 ton BOMAG roller. Um, we've also got a six ton roller for smaller sites. And all of those can give documented output. So we set a target stiffness. Uh, we get uniform compaction across the site, the elimination of soft spots, no over compaction, so no crushing of the stone. 
and we get documented output at the end of the process. So once our ballast level is, is good and solid, um, then it's obviously a track installation next step. So we have three modes of track installation. Uh, first and foremost is um, panel lifters. So installing 16 meter panels, that'll be re-railed at a following um, stage. Um, very flexible system, we've seen great success with this. Um, we've then, what was once considered maybe an outdated uh, method is the, the Geismar Dinelli gantry system, which is a loose sleepering system, and then the long welded rails are thimbled onto the loose sleepers. But combined with our cutting edge geometry control and our compaction is an extremely effective uh, method of, of, of relaying, um, and really seeing big benefits in that paired with our new technologies. And then we've got the new Dune and the Crown, which is the Kirov Multitasker 500 crane, which is a 30 ton lifting capacity. Recently introduced the network trial all over the network in different situations, and is really going to transform the way we do any jobs on the, our network regarding PNCs, bridges, track relay. Really great piece of kit to have to our fingertips. Track is installed in, we have to move on to ballasting it up. So we've got the standard RV dumpers being a seven ton at a time. We've got our high output ballasting system, which is our Hobbs train, which delivers 380 tons in one full swoop. Um, but obviously there's a limitation on engines and drivers, a constraint that we have. And when we were in, in full force with the, the CLRP, there was a, a restraint there. So again, in, part, in, in consultation with our plant tire providers, um, came up with the solution and introduced the RV heavy, heavy haulage system, or the HHS as we call it. Um, and at the moment, we're, with nine trailers, we're delivering 180 tonnes of ballast um, in, one, in one movement. Um, and on our larger renewal sites, it's a combination of all these three uh, ensure that we get successful delivery. Following on from that, once the track's installed, obviously prompt TSR removal, and for those TSRs, temporary speed restriction, prompt TSR removal is essential, not only for services, but also for the asset, as joints left in the formation for long periods can form defects in the ballast. So one week post installation, tamping, welding, stressing, TSRs are moved after one week, then four to six months later, which is around three million tons of traffic, uh, we do consolidation tamp and rail milling. Uh, the consolidation tamp just removes any defects or construction settlement in the track, and then the, the final mill reduces any initial metal flow or any blemishes on the surface, reducing maintenance into the future. So it'll be a, a bigger period from the, to the first maintenance intervention. In this process as well, we've introduced efficiencies. Um, so our rails are delivered into the country in 36 meter rails into Bellevue. They're brought to our facility in Port Leash, where they're welded into 144 meter rails. Um, then they're delivered out to site on our, on our engineering train. Uh, but out on site, then we weld them into 288 meter strings. Um, so reducing the post insulation welding by 50%, obviously that's saving time, get our TSRs off earlier. But obviously no good deed goes unpunished, so these rails were harder to move on site, so we introduced the under, under rail rollers. So the rail is put on top of these, much easier move, much safer, and our productivity for the re-railing process is vastly increased as a result of those. But obviously safety is paramount, and we have to ensure that the quality of track we're producing at all times is well and above what we needed to be and ensure it's safe for services running the following day. One of the disadvantages is working on a, a live network. Um, so at the end of every shift, uh, we run an amber trolley, pre and post damping. Uh, it continuously measures uh, the track geometry, gauge, twist, cant, and, and alerts the user of any defects so it can be rectified before service, return of service. Um, so that's at the end of every shift, but then at the end of our track renewals project, um, a track recording vehicle run um, is done over the site, and that's just a snapshot of the numbers we're receiving. Um, so it's, we're getting around an average, an average rating of 0.6 for track quality on a renewal site. And just to put that into context, a reading of 1.3 would meet our criteria for very good quality track as per our standards. So we're very happy with the product we're producing at the end of the day. Um, with all these um, processes and checks and improved quality, you would think that our productivity levels may have suffered, but it's actually quite the opposite. Um, I know I've gone through here our track renewals process, but we've also gone through a similar process with our ballast cleaning. Um, and with all these processes, increasing our quality 
um, we're actually seeing a huge increase in our productivity. Things are much more streamlined on site. So you can see our levels there where we're increasing. In 2015, we started our ballast cleaning. We're getting 800 metres in a 14-hour possession. Whereas now in 2021, with a 37-hour possession, we're getting 3,240 metres, which is about a 53% increase in productivity, which is a staggering figure considering all we're doing in the background. And similar numbers seen on our relay. Um, so in 2015, in an eight-hour shift, 320 metres. Fast forward to 2021, in a 16-hour shift, we're achieving over a kilometre of track. So 1,008 metres is an average number we're achieving, which is a 53% increase in our, on 2015 levels, which we're extremely, extremely proud about. So where has this led us? Um, so we came from a place where, unfortunately, sometimes track removal sites would have to be handed back at five miles an hour. We went to a place where anything less than 25 miles an hour was absolutely unacceptable. And what we realized is that the quality of track we were producing was far and above what was required for a 25 mile an hour handback. So we challenged ourselves, or some might say we were challenged, um, to hand back a renewal site at 50 miles an hour, which is doubling our standard handback speed. And we obviously had to be conscious of not completely cutting out productivity, still getting value for money. So finding that sweet spot in the middle where we had our quality, we didn't shut down the, the train services for too long, and we got a good, good unit rate to find that sweet spot. So we started um, with our existing possession window of 16 hours, which was our standard window we were getting on the car line at the time, and see what we could achieve within that window. So the challenges we had to overcome were obviously we had to ensure that our geometry control was up to scratch and checked, our compaction was adequate, our plating and clamping system was adequate, how we man managed thermal expansion and our stress-free temperature, and ensuring compliance with our existing technical standards. So without getting into too much detail on it, what we did is we broke down the construction activity into its seven constituent stages. Um, we set minimum thresholds that each of those stages had to meet. Each of those stages were signed off by a competent person, then at the end, all of those sheets were reviewed by, and we received a double sign off from a strictly technical point of view and a senior point of view to ensure that we were happy with a higher speed handback. And, and I'm happy to say that we did achieve a 50 mile hour handback all the way on our panel reeling site, our gantry reeling site using our Dinelli's, and also our ballast cleaning site. So, hugely, hugely positive note there. So, where do we go from here? Um, so what started as the decade of delivery, and as AJ and Andrew said earlier on, is quickly transforming into three decades of delivery. How do, we, how do we ensure that the passenger and our service delivery isn't affected? Because all the passengers see is that big fancy new train. They don't see everything else that's going on in the background from delivering our maintenance programs, renewing the aging asset, enhancing our existing network, and delivering our capital expansion program. And the key to that is efficiency. So efficiency regarding utilization of resources, so get it right first time, eliminate rework. Efficiency regarding getting the maximum out of your possessions. So again, when we are shutting down service, we're getting the absolute maximum from that, so we don't have to disrupt services again. And then, obviously, that will, hopefully, that will knock on to get the efficiency regarding cost, because with public money, we have to be efficient in our unit rates and efficient with our cost. And to that end, we've now set our sights on the next step in our journey. And to coin a phrase previously used by our CEO, Jim Mead, 75 by 25, um, we want to return a renewals site uh, at 75 miles an hour, which we don't believe will be without its challenges. Um, but that's where we believe innovation will derive, be derived from, where further efficiencies will be made, further productivity will be achieved, and then we will be successful in delivering the three decades of work ahead of us, ensuring passenger services. So that's all I have for you. Thanks very much for listening.